All right, welcome everybody to the uh, May 11th, 2020 uh, City of Courtney Council meeting. Uh, we're just gonna start with a preamble. Uh, due to the coronavirus COVID-19 emergency, the City of Courtney with the authority of Ministerial Order M083, Local Government Meetings and Bylaw Procedures COVID-19 has implemented changes to its council meetings. In the interest of public health and safety, public in-person attendance at council chambers uh, will be prohibited until further notice. Council meetings will be presided by the mayor or acting mayor with electronic participation by council and staff. Meetings are available for viewing via live web streaming or video recording on the City of Courtney website and will start at 1 p.m. during this period. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded traditional territories of the uh, Comox First Nation. And with that, uh, we'll go into adoption of minutes. I move that we adopt the May 4th uh, regular council meeting minutes. Second. Excellent. Are there any questions or comments regarding any of the minutes? Uh, seeing none, uh, unless anybody is against them, I will uh, assume that they are received. And we'll move on to uh, staff reports and presentations. If somebody would like to move, um, uh, Corey uh, Vanderhorst uh, from MNP. I'll move receipt. Seconded. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCollum and Councillor Hillian. And I will pass it over to uh, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hello, Councillors, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. A uh, little bit different routine, but uh, so I'm going to share my screen and run you through our uh, audit presentation. Um, one of the things that happens when I do the share screen is I can't see everybody. I want to see a couple people and, and the mayor as well won't be able to see everybody. So I'll ask that you hold questions till the end. Um, and then we could, we'll have a chance to, to go through that. That, that has uh, worked sorry fairly to, well in the past. Sorry to interrupt, uh, yeah, Mr. Allen. Yeah, uh, I just wanted, before uh, we turn it over to Corey, I'd like to turn it back to uh, Jennifer Nelson uh, so she can set the stage and then Corey can run with it if that's all right. Yeah, no, that's totally that's fine. I, I realized I should have done that. Uh, so thanks for catching that, I appreciate it. Oh, you're still muted. Oh, there we go. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you uh, through the CAO to Mayor and Council. So before we turn it over to Corey Vanderhorst, he's uh, with Myers Norris Penny, the accounting firm that uh, does the annual audit for the City of Courtney. Uh, he'll present the audit findings um, and the city's 2019 audited financial statements. Um, in addition, before I turn it over, I would like to um, acknowledge our finance staff. Everybody worked really hard this year uh, to prepare these financial statements. And in particular, uh, Renata Vika, she's our manager of finance. So her and her team um, oversaw the process and uh, had to revert to remote audit work uh, during this COVID-19 situation. So they really rose to the occasion and, and managed during a, a really difficult time. So I just wanted to thank her and her team, uh, as well as Krista McClintock, she's our accountant, also working very hard to prepare these financial statements for us. So with that said, I will turn it over to Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I will echo Jennifer's comments. Um, not a not a usual year by any uh, stretch of the imagination. And um, the team there did really well, Jennifer and Renata, particularly to help us. Um, you know, we didn't uh, set foot in the city's office this year to do the audit, which is very unusual. It's not the normal routine, um, but we were able to do everything electronically and uh, it went, I mean, about as smooth as you can expect with that, that routine um, and your staff did a wonderful job uh, helping us through sort of this new situation this year. Um, so I am going to share a screen now and we'll get into uh, the formal part of the presentation. And make sure I get the right screen there. So everybody should be able to see my first slide, just the title screen. Um, for today and we'll, we'll walk through. So uh, as in past years, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the financial statements. We'll talk a little bit about the audit um, and the audit process, and then we'll end with a little bit of analysis. So a reminder that uh, what you're seeing is consolidated. You've got your general operations, water, sewer, capital, your reserve funds, the gaming fund for some of the monies that are coming in that way. Um, that is what the accounting standards require us to, to um, put in the audited financial statements. Um, but it's not necessarily how you can think about it when you're looking at budgets and other 
uh, other documents. On the statement of financial position or the balance sheet at the end of 2019, what we can see is cash and investments of uh, about 49 and a half million. So about a million dollar increase there from the prior year's numbers. Uh, total financial assets of 53.1, down a little bit from the 53.4 in the, in the uh, prior year. Long-term debt being paid down on schedule of $10 million at the end of 2019. And if we add in the long-term debt and the regular payables, wages payable, things like that, um, the city has a $34.4 million uh, liability position at the end of 2019. Taking the total financial assets at 53, subtract off the 34 liabilities, you get what we call the net financial asset position. So that's the liquid positive position there. Then there's $159 million on the books of uh, capital assets. Again, that's the historic cost of those assets um, depreciated for usage. So that is not a replacement cost figure. Um, that's just the, the accountant's accumulating cost over the years. And the accumulated surplus at the end of the year of 178 million. We'll look at that in the future slide, but it's important to note that most of that is the physical assets. It's 159 uh, million of physical assets are in that number. The next uh, thing to look at is the income statement or the statement of operations. So total revenues for the year were uh, 67 million. Um, there's about an $8.3 million increase from 2018. There is a large increase in uh, donated assets. Um, so not, not cash flows necessarily. Um, on the expense side, um, uh, about a $2.6 million increase to the 52.2 that you see there. And the annual surplus, um, on an accounting basis of 14.7 million. So about 5.6 million increase. Again, um, that does not include any of the capital purchases happened throughout the year. Um, so we'll see that on a future slide. Um, and it's got adjustments for deferred revenues, uh, receivables and payables. So that's an accountant surplus at the end of 2019, not necessarily a cash surplus position. Yeah, I mentioned there's a, a lot of capital purchase, a lot of capital activity. So $10.2 million of, of physical asset uh, for projects throughout 2019. Uh, and there was $9.6 million of developer contributions. Um, so assets contributed um, to the city. If we look at the cash flows, try and unwind and step back from those accountant surplus numbers. We can see that operations uh, throughout 2019 brought in $11.7 million. That's, that's down a little bit from 2018 to 14.5. I mentioned already just shy of $10 million of, of capital asset projects and purchases. $2 million transferred into the investments to make sure you're earning the best rate of return on any of those monies that are in reserves and set aside for the future. And debt being paid down on schedule, just shy of a million dollars uh, annually. So there's a net cash inflow to the main bank accounts of $3.2 million for 2019. And the last slide then for the financial statements uh, is what is in that $178 million accumulated surplus number that we have there. So 149 million is invested in the physical assets. That's, uh, that's all your roads, water, sewer, uh, buildings, equipment, things like that. Um, that's the value on the books. There is $16.6 .6 million set aside in reserves for future projects. And that's very consistent with the prior year's number. The capital fund has a, another million and a half set aside for future projects. Operating fund is 9.2, very minor change year over year from 2018. And the gaming fund of 1.8, again, a very minor change from 2018. So where we see the big increase in value here is in those capital assets, both the, the donated assets contributed from developers um, and the uh, purchased assets throughout 2019. So our audit is all done. Um, we're happy to provide another clean audit opinion uh, for the city this year, auditor speak is it's an unqualified audit opinion. Uh, the last step in the audit process is council approval today. Uh, we have all the, the documents and, and paperwork in to be able to wrap up um, and, and hand that over to, uh, to Jen and David this afternoon. Our audit findings, uh, again, our audit, res uh, audit process, what do we do? We look at the controls in place at the city. We look at how they're designed, how they're implemented. We don't necessarily test the effectiveness, um, but then we sample transactions throughout a year to form our audit opinion. We don't look at every transaction to form our audit opinion. Um, that's just not uh, feasible within the, the cost parameters of an audit. 
we didn't find any irregularities this year. Um, so that, that's just sort of a no news is a good news statement. No evidence of conflict of interest, unusual transactions. Uh, we aren't specifically fraud investigators, but if something came to our attention, I would have to bring it to your attention as counsel. Uh, again, uh, an acknowledgement and formal thank you to staff for, excuse me, Benjamin, can you go upstairs, please? Upstairs, please. Apologies. Uh, thank you to staff for uh, the excellent work this year um, in, in putting, putting together the audit in unusual circumstances. Uh, the last item for the audit uh, and the audit discussion is to confirm that MMP is independent of the city. Um, we have to stay within our independence rules to be able to give you an independent audit opinion. I'll wrap up by looking at some of the financials. So the, we started by looking at a snapshot of the 2019 financials in that one year. Then for this financial analysis, we look back at a five year stretch um, uh, from about 2015 to, to 2019. and look at what are the trends and, and how are things moving at the city. So the first thing we look at is assets to liabilities. We're looking for this ratio to be above one. It's about $6 of assets for every $1 of liability. And it, it's been around that mark for the last five years. More importantly, we wanna look at the financial assets to liabilities, that liquid ratio of, of cash and receivables. Um, what this, again, we want this to be above one. Um, if you've got funds above one or uh, net financial asset position, that means that you uh, have funds available to pay for future projects. If you have that number below one, it means you are taxing or raising revenues in the future to pay for past transactions. So this uh, ratio is trending uh, upwards. It has steadily increased over the past five years. Um, it's greater than one, it's currently 1.54. Um, so that is a healthy indicator for the city. Then we look at flexibility. We'll look at your debt charges compared to revenue um, that has decreased to 0.87%. Um, that's reflecting both the pay down of debt and your interest costs declining, as well as the revenue, some of the revenue increases that we saw earlier. The other thing that we look at with flexibility is the rough age of the capital assets. Now, this is not a full asset management uh, look. This doesn't bring into account um, condition assessments, replacement costs, or any of the timing of replacement. But what this does is this takes the aged value or depreciated value of the assets and compares it to your original cost. It gives you a rough idea of if you're keeping up with some of the aging infrastructure uh, that you might have in the, in the community. So the carrying value of, of capital assets for 2019 was 62.2%. That is consistent with the past five years, um, which has been in a, you know 61.3 to 62.6. Um, so what that tells us is there's, there's variation and fluctuations. Um, and we know there's been lots of capital projects on the go. You're, you're holding, uh, holding steady, it's not declining. Um, declining would mean there are significant aging infrastructure and things that would need immediate, more immediate attention. So it means you're holding on this one um, and, and uh, keeping up with some of those capital projects. And the last ratio we'll look at is vulnerability. Again, looking at other levels of government, provincial or federal funding, um, consistently around five or 6%, 2019, 6.1, no change from the last few years. What we see with this one generally is we see spikes when there's uh, large pots of infrastructure money available uh, from the federal government or large projects that you're, that you're going through um, and, and are getting grant funding for. So you can see here, it's been fairly consistent um, and it ha we haven't really seen those spikes for the last five years. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, taking the time to listen to my presentation. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, pause for questions. Excellent. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> my screen's bouncing around a little bit on me here, but it uh, uh, seems to have settled down. Uh, was there any uh, questions that anybody had, if you want to raise your hand? Uh, maybe while I'm waiting, uh, one of the, the uh, comments in there, one of the slides, and uh, they weren't numbered, so I'm just going to uh, go to the slide um, where you talked about the financial ratio, and I believe it was like 1.54-ish. Uh, yes. That's what I wrote down here. Um, and, and I guess one of the things, uh, what I heard is it's good uh, because that means that we have more money than what, what we're spending to a certain degree, uh, or we're not gonna borrow money for past expenditures or raise money for past expenditures, if I was understanding that correctly. Um, and, and I guess um, just knowing like what num what's a good number, because it sounds like it's good, but is, is there such thing as say 
too good of a number where maybe we're, we've got too much uh, banked out or, or do you think we're in a pretty sweet spot? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I mean, there, there would potentially be a spot where it's too high. Um, I wouldn't be able to comment on what, what, what that would be for the city or where it is, but um, you know, it's really more a, a, a comment of being above one or below one um, with some of the communities that we see that are in net debt positions. Um, it really limits, we call this a sustainability uh, number, but it is mm -hmm. really a, a flexibility. You lose some of that flexibility when you're, um, when larger portions of, of tax revenue, for example, other things are going to pay for large debt loads. So there's the tricky balance of what's the right debt level for the community uh, versus taxation levels and, and other, and user fees, of course, and other ways to fund things. Um, there's no magic number that is too high, um, but uh, we, we generally do comment if people are dipping below one that you're passing a lot more burden on to the future taxpayers. Okay, and, and maybe what might be useful, uh, uh, just because you said there are some that are, are below one, is maybe a comparator to say, here's where other municipalities are, just so that we can kind of gauge So I mean, it sounds like it's positive, it's good news. It's just, um, uh, you know, when we get thrown a whole bunch of numbers like this, uh, having a little bit of context, uh, I, I think is, uh, uh, is good. But I think, I think you've explained yourself really well. Uh, we do have a few um, hands up, uh, Councillor Frisch. Uh, your mic. Hey, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to comment on the, the net book value. And um, I think intrinsically, one would think if we want to we want to increase that and make ourselves seem like we're really keeping up with things, we could just spend more on our um, on our assets and renewing our assets. But you could also look at it from the other perspective of taking old assets that are highly depreciated and taking them off the books. Um, I'm not suggesting we go through the list and start getting rid of stuff in the city, but um, I suppose that is the other side of the coin, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good point, Councilor First, is, is that there is a, an element of the very old assets. You're talking things that are 40, 50, 60 years old that would be skewing this ratio. Um, the, and that's why it's, it's, in my mind, it's less about what the number is than where it's trending, right? Because as it's, if it's trending and I've, you know, talking to some other communities this year, uh, some trending up significantly over five years, some trending down. The ones that are trending up or staying flat are, there's significant capital projects ongoing and, and you're doing the things you need to do to replace roads, water, sewer, and make sure that the service levels stay the same for the community. Um, where we see it trending downward is where we see lots of problems and uh, you know, you, then you start to get into problems with your sewer infrastructure and your water infrastructure and things like that. So the, the flat and trending up is, you know, what I would say is the acceptable place to be um, uh, with, as you compare to some of your neighboring communities and things. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a red flag at this point, um, but those are excellent, uh, excellent points, Council. And, and sorry, the financial, um, is it financial ratio? Is that the last one we just spoke of at 1.54? Yes. Um, so what, what would, um, you know, something like this pandemic, what effect would that have on our financial ratio if we're, um, you know, seeing us spending a million dollars, for instance, of our gaming revenues and not receiving a million next year? What sort of effect will that have on our financial ratio? Yeah, I would expect to, as we're as we're talking to communities around the island and seeing the, um, you know, the, the change in approach, the things you're going to have to be paying for. Um, uh, you know, what it does to staffing levels, what it does to service levels and recreation and to whatever other activities have been um, curbed or, or reduced, I guess is a better word for it. Um, I would expect to see some decreases in these net financial assets positions. Um, we're uh, having lots of conversations around cash flows, current cash flows. Uh, you know, traditionally in a community, there's an influx of uh, a tax time in July, August, right? And, and and cash flow coming through. So what that looks like is going to be um, very interesting this year. Um, and I know your staff is working on, uh, you know, those types of projections to to see um, where the service levels can be maintained and, and what the cash flow issues could be. Um, I, I'd expect to see a, a de decrease of some sort next year. Yeah, thanks. I imagine we, it would be uh, kind of like dipping into your personal savings, which I'm sure a lot of us are doing right now. And it might be more than a dip for the city. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. 
and Councillor McClellan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, and thank you for the presentation. And uh, I also just wanted to um, congratulate our, our finance staff on a, a lot of hard work and an excellent audit. Um, I also had a question around the um, assets to liability slide and just um, how that um, those two things are related a little bit differently to each other uh, with a municipality than it would be for a corporation. But generally assets are um, held in a company to generate revenue, whereas in a city that the more assets means the more that you have to maintain. And so they're um, connected a little bit differently than we would see on a regular balance sheet. Um, especially when it comes to developer contributions, I assume that those are probably like roads and um, new new service live or obligations that the city is acquiring as we do new subdivisions. Is, is that what that figure is mostly related to? Yeah, in terms of the, the um, contributor revenue coming in, absolutely. And, and it is very much so, you know, the, the accounting rules, uh, we set it up as an asset and record the revenue, but you've also got the corresponding future cost associated with the, the roads, the water, the sewer, uh, the infrastructure, the street lighting that gets put in. Um, so the uh, there's sort of two things that you're looking at when we look at that assets to li liabilities. One is the financial assets and, and what's there and what's uh, available to pay for uh, future projects and, and future service levels. And the other one is, you know, when you look at the overall assets to liabilities of the non-financial assets, which are both providing service levels to the community um, and have costs associated with them, right? Uh, ongoing maintenance operations and then the future replacement and that's where you get into the asset management um, program and project being very important, um, needing to know when, what condition those assets are in, when they need to be replaced, um, and, and to give your um, finance team the ability to budget out and plan out appropriately um, for uh, debt levels and reserve levels and things like that. And um, I mean, I have full confidence in our in our city staff that th those types of things are being well looked after. Um, but it, is there any kind of analysis that comes out of those ratios that you would see um, in an audit that would indicate that too many assets are coming on without? Um, like, I don't, I'm not sure which way that ratio would go, um, where it's maybe we're accumulating more assets, but it's not necessarily an indication of better financial health in the organization. Right, and that, uh, it's a good question, but it's not something necessarily con contemplated by the financial statement audit. Um, I think one of, the, um, one of the important pieces of the asset management um, project would be that it's not just shelfware, that it's a living, breathing thing and that you are constantly adapting and adjusting. And that project would be able to point to you know, bringing um, a specific asset online and then what are the future costs associated with that asset um, versus, you know, uh, redoing a chunk of road is a very different game from a rec center or a water treatment plant or things like that. So um, it's not something that's necessarily in the financial statement audit or something that we comment on at this point. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to make the final comment that um, it's uh, it's nice to see that liquid ratio number pointed out and seeing a positive trend. It, I imagine that 2020 is probably going to be a, a blip um, in the opposite direction, but um, seeing that that's been a five-year trend for our community is, is a good indicator for how we're going to weather this um, situation. So, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Mr. Allen, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, this is not the time or place really to get into the details, but just to, to say, and, and I'm sure Corey understands that um, there are things called sustainability ratios, which have been identified uh, through the IPEWA. Um, and that is uh, a sort of a leader in uh, developing criteria for measuring uh, sustainability uh, and performance in asset management. Um, so those, those uh, ratios are, are currently in use primarily with the District of North Vancouver, um, but our own business performance folks are uh, fully aware of them and they will be uh, making more of a presence as we go forward in uh, future uh, budgets. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that might generate uh, more interest um, and, and uh, I guess uh, uh, for, for the city's 
actual uh, current uh, position and show trends going forward. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like great information to have in the future. Thanks. Awesome. And uh, Councillor Hillian. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thanks, Corey, for the presentation. Um, I also want to acknowledge your adept uh, juggling of parental and professional responsibilities, as a lot of people are doing these days. Um, and um, I'll also um, just uh, thank you for your um, appreciative notes towards staff and their cooperation uh, and um, appreciate the ongoing professional relationship between your firm and our staff. Um, I appreciate the work that uh, is going on, and, but I wanted to ask a question that takes us in a slightly different direction. We've uh, been focusing over the last couple of years on uh, natural assets. And I'm just wondering if uh, you're starting to see uh, natural assets reflected in any of the audits that you're performing with uh, other communities uh, around the province or across the country with your firm. Thank you, Councillor Hillian, uh, and thank you for the kind words. Yeah, we, that's a good question. We, we, this dialogue is is, um, is starting. Um, we're starting to see some communities um, put some extra disclosure in the financial statements uh, around the benefits of natural assets, um, what it means for their cost savings. You know, you look at a watershed and uh, you know not having to run pipe or whatever because you're able to use natural storm drainage um, and. and uh, um, or other things that would impact, you know, beachfront erosion and things like that. Um, we're really only seeing it at the disclosure stage. Um, we've had the conversations and sit on a, a national group and we've been pushing the standard setters to think about it, but it's a very tough thing for the standard setters who are used to a historic look back type of uh, model to have that kind of, um, uh, measurement or put to put numbers behind something which is really looking forward or or, or looking at uh how much you're saving as opposed to what you spent um so the dialogue is there it's starting to happen um it's very important i, I know some communities um uh over on the uh, the other coast are are putting some uh, some disclosure in and some things like that and something that, that we would definitely entertain a conversation of um, these are your financial statements and, and what goes in them is, is, is your choice to put in there. Um, we're only here to tell you if it's uh, accurate or not. Um, but it, it is, uh, there are good dialogue happening and I think it's important to, to start thinking about some of those pieces. Thanks. Uh, I, um, I know that uh, we're certainly preoccupied with the impact of the pandemic on our finances and the economic uh, stability of the community. But um, I'm hoping that we don't lose sight of some of these um, bigger picture uh, uh, directions that we've been trending in. So thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and I think, yeah, when, when we talk about uh, eco assets, uh, I think it was probably about five years ago that we started talking about, you know, having our um, lake uh, and water intake kind of looking at it from that perspective. But yeah, it's been cer certainly slow going, but yeah, I think it's uh, Seashelt or Gibson. I think it's Seashelt actually that um, yeah. uh, has been doing that. So, um, but yeah, so ho hopefully we can meander in that direction uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, I, I know there was some focus on getting like a water treatment project going uh, that kind of took precedent over the rest of it, but uh, uh, we've also had some uh, good conferences here locally uh, around that as well. Um, uh, Councillor Frisch. Thanks, Mayor. Just finding the right button. I just wanted to just put my weight behind that uh, comment by Councillor Hilly, and um, I also find that uh, financial statements are really good at um, capturing things that we pay money for and uh, often miss a lot of external costs and a lot of external benefits, which is exactly what eco assets are providing. And so, um, yeah, I look forward to the day when we can start to think a little more broadly than, than simply um, checks and balances, money going in and out. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I know there is certainly a, a, a leaning towards the, the built or engineered gray infrastructure kind of thing where, uh, you know, you can, you know, everything's got a number attached to it basically. So uh but uh yeah uh but i i think it's coming uh i don't see any further questions or comments so uh having uh, seen no more i'm just going to pull council uh for um uh acceptance on receipt here uh, starting with Co Councilor cole hamilton in favor Councilor frisch 
Uh oh. In favor. <laughs> Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And myself is in favor as well. So uh, that's 100%. Uh, great job, uh, Corey. Really appreciate it. I know it can be challenging. Uh, I actually come to City Hall for this just to, to make sure my interruptions are kept to a minimum. So uh, uh, re really understand uh, where you are. I, I spend most of my uh, my working days uh, in front of a computer at home. So uh, I, I know the challenges, uh, but I think, uh, uh, again, this this presentation has been as good as all your other ones. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Awesome. And thanks to staff again for helping Corey uh, get through the process. And uh, with that, we'll let you go, Corey, and have yourself a great day. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Uh, next on the agenda, we have the uh, OCP uh, official community plan consultation requirements. I'm happy to move this, Mayor, if that's okay. Yeah. It's like yeah so I'll move that. I'll, I'll move that uh, based on the May 11th, 2020 staff report entitled official community plan consultation requirements that council approve option one as follows that council, council give consideration to the requirements of section 475 of the local government act and that council direct staff to consult with the Comox Valley Regional District, Town of Comox, Village of Cumberland, Comox First Nation, School District 71, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, <laughs> Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, uh, the Ministry of Forestry and Lands, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Island Health, and that the consultation with uh, the Comox First Nation include no less than two meetings between the Chief and Council and City Council, in addition to referral of a draft copy of the OCP with 60 days uh, written comment prior to the bylaw adoption. And that Council direct City staff to engage with regular meetings with the staff from Comox First Nation throughout the development of the OCP and also that consultation with the, uh, pardon my pronunciation, Leich, Quill, Tak, Council of Chiefs, uh, the Wai Wai Kum, Kwai Wau, Kwaika First Nation and the Homalco Indian Band occur through a notice of OCP review process and referral of a draft copy within 60 days for written comment. And finally, that the consultation uh, methods with the ministries, agencies, and local governments identified follow the recommendations in this report. Now is the time to second it. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Hamilton. Uh, that was certainly a, uh, uh, a mouthful to say the, the least. Uh, 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 Mr. Allen, did you have a comment? Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to turn this over to Ian Buck, our Director of Development Services, who can summarize the report and take questions from Council. Great, thanks very much through the CAO to Mayor and Council. Um, I apologize for the, the long resolution, but a lot of stuff that needs to be covered there. Um, as outlined in the resolution, this follows the requirements of the Local Government Act, and in particular, Section 475. Um, it requires Council to contemplate who they want to consult with and the degree of that consultation. The resolution outlines what staff have put together um, as being the important um, local governments that uh, we share boundaries with, uh, the First Nation and other organizations, largely the uh, uh, provincial and, and federal government organizations that um, we deal regularly with. Uh, in particular, as outlined, um, the consultation with KFN, we feel uh, at a staff level should be uh, above and beyond what we're doing with our other uh, First Nations that share territory here. Um, KFN is an important um, neighbor of ours and building the relationship um, with them beyond what it is today um, is important through this process. Staff have met um, with um, Comox First Nation planning staff uh, to introduce the OCP process and discuss how we may get together. Um, still need to figure out, um, especially in today's world uh, and our Zoom meetings, what those meetings will look like. Um, but we do feel it's important in the next sort of month to six weeks uh, to get a kickoff meeting with them um, between mayor and council and, uh, and their chief and council. Um, in particular, as we get into the summer with our growth scenarios and um, begin more uh, broad public consultation. Uh, and then of course, at the end of the process, once we start developing policy, we think it would be a, a great time to, um, to have that engagement as well. 
Um, should during the process any other requests um, by either party come up for more consultation, that's uh, absolutely a policy uh, a possibility. We just think that uh, minimum of two is necessary. Uh, with the other First Nations, um, similar to what we do with uh, some of the local governments, a, a referral is what we're recommending. So we'll give them sort of the heads up that we're uh, entering into this process or, um, and then give them the opportunity to comment. As with any of the organizations, if they have questions they, um, they want to ask or comments throughout the process at a staff level, we're happy to, uh, happy to do that. Um, I just want to add as well, uh, last comment is that these groups are in addition to our OCP advisory committee that council has set up. And that represents a broad interest um, of organizations across, um, across the city, including cultural organization, environmental organizations, um, that sort of thing. Um, and it's in addition to, uh, of course, the public consultation that we're doing throughout the process. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, and we do have a couple of hands up. Uh, Councillor um, Morin, I believe that was. I just. Right, thank you, Mayor. Um, well, it's exciting. Every, every little piece of information we get around the OCP is exciting for me, um, even though I know that we are uh, impacted by COVID. Um, I just, I'm, well, I'm really happy to see the emphasis on um, connecting with. Comox First Nation and and uh, really um, having a fulsome uh, engagement with them. I also know that we have the school district as uh, on our list as well, and we do have folks from the school district on the advisory committee, I believe. And I just uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really hoping that we can um, really make that discussion fulsome as well. Of course, a lot of and a lot of um, opportunities there, partnership, and I'd love for us to even go further to create some kind of protocol agreement or something with the school district around the that have and how we to meet some of our goals around a variety of things, or something, or social needs, or communities, or food security, whatever that might be. So um, I don't know if there's any uh, that is kind of beyond what what a normal kind of consultation would be with the school district, and whether there's opportunity to to go a bit further in that regard. Now, uh, Councillor Moore, and I'm not sure if other people had a hard time, but about 90% of what you just said, unfortunately, I got lost to the cyber god. So um, okay, I, I um, can I, I can come a bit closer more engagement on the uh, school district uh, 71 yeah that's too bad usually my volume works fairly well uh, i was just saying i appreciate um the emphasis on connecting with home first nation and consultation Are you okay now oh okay. hang on just one second what's happening it's almost like your internet's dropping out maybe if you turn off your video uh and then your bandwidth could be focused on the audio Okay, how am I now? Is that any better? Way better. Oh, good. Okay. So I'll just be, try to be really quick. So I appreciate um, the emphasis being put on consultation with um, Comox First Nation and um, the attention to that. I think it's really important. I was bringing up that I know that we have the school district on our, our list to consult with and there, I believe we have some reps on the advisory committee as well, or at least one. Um, and I'm just hoping that we can have quite fulsome con consultation with school district as they do have land. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for partnerships, whether that's around housing or social needs or food security, any of those things. And I guess, you know, I'd love to see some kind of protocol agreement or something specifically with the school district. And so my question was, whether this process allows for that and whether we can kind of go beyond, um, uh, con you know, regular consultation or um, I guess, sorry, I did have my question formulated better in the last round. <laughs> um, 
I don't know if uh, Mr. Bach heard any of it the first time around, but just um, I see some a lot of good opportunities with the school district and wondering um, how we can bring that forward. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. I think I understand the um, uh, the general nature of it. It was a little bit broken up, but uh, we do at a staff level ha um, have regular meetings um, between senior staff at the city um, as well as uh, school district staff. Um, that, that doesn't get into um, the political side of things, but operationally we do speak about projects that are happening. We do talk about uh, rec and cultural opportunities um, with the shared facilities. But as you mentioned, there, there may be options to go beyond that. The OCP certainly opens the door for those discussions, um, especially at a policy level. Going beyond um, the OCP, if there's interest, um, I would leave that up to council if they want to form a, a different relationship between uh, between city council and the school board. Excellent, and and it might be worth noting, uh, you know, for the last uh, year and a bit, a uh, year and a half, I guess. Um, uh, uh, um, we've been meeting as leaders locally, uh, the mayors, um, as well as uh, KFN chief and the chair of the regional district and the base commander. Um, since COVID-19, uh, basically since March 16th, we've expanded that uh, to also include the police chief and the school district. Um, and that's been really useful, I think, especially right now. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, last, uh, last uh, meeting that we had, you know, was talking about uh, graduation and, and how that can move forward, which is really a school district um, problem, but it's, it's our whole community to, to uh, come up with a solution. So um, uh, so to a certain degree, some of that might be happening and may continue to happen after uh, we get through the pandemic. But uh, I thought it might be worth just, just mentioning that we are having those, those discussions. So if anybody does have anything that they would like to pass on or questions for the school district, um, it's a, a, a meeting with um, uh, Tom, the superintendent, uh, uh, is part of those meetings. And, and uh, so, yeah, so that, that's another opportunity that we have right now. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think there is an appetite from, from the board level to, to have uh, kind of a more formalized um, uh, kind of agreement around some of the land, land use. Um, you know, there's a, one example is that that piece of property between Lake Trail and uh, Puntledge. And so there just may be some opportunities around planning there that I just wanted to, to, to bring that up. Thank you. Nope, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move right along, Councillor Fritch. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, I guess I'd like to start by thanking um, staff, um, especially our CAO and, uh, and uh, Director Buck um, and all the staff and um, development services for, I think, hitting the nail on the head on this one. I know when this council uh, came to the table a year and a half ago, we were fairly ambitious with the progressive vision, and I think this really is emblematic of what we're looking for. So thank you very much for that. Um, my question does <laughs> pertain to a consultation, and that's um, uh, if if one of the organizations does want to come through with uh, some different idea than what's uh, already out there. How, how does that process work? Does that idea then go to your working group? Does it make its way to council? Um, I imagine you're getting a lot of ideas. And so I'm just kind of wondering how things like that would flow through to the end. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point and good question. Um, I guess it really depends on the nature of, of what that is. Um, through consultation, um, like we've provided uh, with the ideas fair, we like to try and include all comments that we get um, so council can see those. Um, when we're dealing, depending again on, on what the relationship is, if there's an idea coming out of one of the groups uh, that has merit to develop policy, we would work on policy around that and present it to council with comments that, that came through from uh, whichever group that was. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question. But I, I think, yeah, sorry to cut you off. I, I think in essence that that does clarify it for me. Um, a lot of the ideas that we're gonna be getting right now might not be policy ideas, but our, our job here is to set the stage with good policy that those ideas could come to fruition and um, uh, you know, if they were meant to be, but uh, not necessarily make every single one of them happen. Is that, would that be your take on it? 
It, yeah, exactly. And some of them may not, um, some of them may just be a very high level statement in an OCP that could lead to further development of policy after the OCP is done. Um, mm -hmm. Again, depending on the nature of it and some ideas, um, it, it, yeah, just uh, lots of ideas out there. So they may not make their way through the process. Well, certainly, uh, you know, ones that uh, relate to sustainable delivery of services and uh, quality of life and greenhouse gases. Um, I would expect that uh, we could we could work with those. So thanks very much. Absolutely. Excellent. And thanks, Mayor. I did hear the mayor talking about the uh, police chief because I was going to ask about uh, first responders um, uh, having a part of the discussion and uh, being involved in the communication. So. Uh, I, I believe that, um, that that was touched on by the mayor um, and it could be elaborated if, if you'd like. But secondly, um, I heard Mr. Buck talking about um, a few of the organizations uh, that weren't listed here that were still part of the committee, uh, sounded like environmental and cultural components. And I know that um, there was uh, uh, somebody from the um, representing the uh, Home Builders Association uh, but um, I would like to know more about uh, that communication with the uh, economic side of, uh, of uh, the uh, ledger and uh, the employment side. To, so, uh, you know, that representation from either communication with economic development or Chamber of Commerce, um, tourism, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks again for that question. We do have, um, as you mentioned, um, there's a representative of the, of the development industry. We have uh, a representative from real estate um, on our advisory committee, as well as um, the Chamber of Commerce is represented through that. Um, CVEDs, we deal with more at uh, staff, uh, staff to staff level. We refer things back and forth to each other. Um, so they're not represented through um, the consultation that's identified in this report, um, but are a strong part of our advisory committee. Okay. All right. And Councillor Hillian. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the challenge for staff uh, during this time uh, when it's uh, very difficult to have public meetings. Uh, but I, I do wonder if staff have, um, have put their minds to um, how we might uh, move forward with the public consultation um, that we want to take place. Um, I've been getting a fair amount of feedback from people in the community uh, with regard to development uh, applications that we have coming forward and a discomfort with um, electronic uh, public hearings. Um, and I did see a, um, um, a description of um, actually a, a protest gathering in a, in a public square in Israel where the organizers had um, uh, taped out squares on the floor to enable people to stand at a separate distance. Um, and I wondered if there might be something like that that we could do and still make use of uh, a facility like the Philberg to permit um, some actual public gatherings uh, and maintain social distance to help us to get the, uh, the consultation that we want uh, in relation to our OCP and, and our other processes. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the, the question. And it's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, we haven't had a lot of detailed discussion about what's going to happen down the road. Um, the challenge, whether it's with a, a, a public hearing on an application or consultation for the OCP is even with social distancing, we're still limited um, by 50 people under the provincial health order. If that were to change, that may open up the doors um, to, to more opportunities we have conceptually thought that we could still at a neighborhood level do outdoor engagement. So walkabouts in a neighborhood, um, need those strong outside voices for that, but um, may be able to get a group of people to do those walkthroughs that have always been intended. And again, the hope that uh, over the course of the summer, maybe um, maybe things improve and, and allow for more of that. Uh, the comments on the uh, electronic communication um, yeah, they're well taken and it's something for public hearings we'll have to bring forward to contemplation. We certainly don't want to leave voices out of whatever process we're doing um, that's public. We always, um, you know, the fallback is always there for written communication. 
Um, some people prefer that. Some people would rather have that face-to-face -face style communication uh, to get points across. So definitely we're still wrestling with it um, as all organizations are. And uh, we'll be bringing forward reports um, as we go through the process. I think just finally towards, uh, you know, if we do get to a point where we're feeling we haven't done adequate consultation, then that's what we'll bring forward a report to council to, uh, to consider options at that time. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Allen, did you want to follow up? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, so we, uh, the mayor and I were on a call with Minister Robinson last Thursday, and one of the issues that was brought up was uh, the ministerial order M139, which replaces uh, ministerial order M083. Essentially, that allows for electronic public hearings, and I, I get that um, it's not ideal. And um, so it's, 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 it is a trade-off between having that sort of unfettered previous process and uh, dealing with moving forward on what I would say is almost an unprecedented level of development in, in this, at the city. Um, uh, will, staff will be updating council on our corporate work plan. Um, of course, there's a lot of moving targets, but uh, we've been putting our mind to our work plan and I've been getting updates from all the directors and uh, one of them is uh, Ian Buck and his uh, department and and we're just uh, they're flying by the seat of their pants with the the level of uh, development both uh, recently completed and pending um, so it's a serious issue we are putting our mind to how we might implement those things but then of course there's also that graduated uh, transition back to whatever the new normal is. Um, all right, uh, Council, or, um, uh, Council McCollum. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, just to kind of chime in on the discussion that we're having around um, how we're engaging, how we're able to engage the public in these times. I'm wondering if um, there has been any opening or discussion at this point of some type of hybrid um, model where, you know, we could have people social distanced inside inside council chambers for those who are not comfortable using media but i mean i think at this point the vast majority of the public have already attended a zoom meter meeting of one form or another and maybe that is a way that we could still allow for the public to gain some type of access but um not have the same numbers that we would see at a a, a typical busy public hearing if i could just respond to that um, these are things that staff are putting their mind, our minds to, and again, these uh, orders and changes have uh, only come uh, very recently, and they continue to sort of unfold on, on a weekly basis. Uh, so I just ask for your patience, uh, and we'll, we'll report out uh, more thoroughly in the coming days. That sounds great. Thanks. Excellent. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, seeing none. I'll just pull council uh, if they're in favor of the OCP consultation requirements uh, motion that Councillor Frisch and Cole Hamilton put forward. Uh, so starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well. So uh, we'll let that uh, uh, be unanimous uh, moving forward. Uh, we do need to go back uh, to the um, uh, presentation by Corey uh, Vanderhurst, where we did uh, receive his uh, motion, uh, but we did not actually make the motion to accept. Uh, uh, Mr. Richter, could you um, explain what we need to do? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, there was a staff report with a recommended resolution from staff um, to approve the audited financial statements, and I'd like to see a resolution on that for clarity, please, if I may. So moved. Oh, oh. seconded. All right, and that was on page five of the uh, of our uh, agenda. Uh, it's been moved and seconded, and that was to um, approve option one uh, uh, and the approving uh, the actual audit uh, by the year ended uh, December thirty first, uh, two thousand nineteen. And now, council or. Uh, I'll poll council again uh, for uh, your vote. Uh, starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. 
Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCullum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well. So that again, they came down. Excellent. Mr. Mayor, you, it's John here. You can put my hand down. I was just going to point that out as well, but Wendy beat me to it. So thank you. So we're all good. We're we're all caught up. Uh, thanks so much for that. And yeah, anytime if, if I if we if we uh, skip over something, yeah, just throw your hand up, and I'll I'll, I'll circle back to you because you end up on the top of my list here. So uh, thank thanks so much for for getting the note here. Um, uh, moving right along, we have the uh, structural change liquor license application. Uh, are we hearing from staff or would you like me to move the recommendation first? Uh, no, I, I think it would be helpful to move the recommendation okay. first. Okay. okay. So I'll move that based on the May 20, I'll turn off my video again. Based on the May 11, 2020 staff report, structural change to liquor license application, Ace Brewing Company Limited. 150 Mansfield Drive, Council approve option one as follows. One, the Council of the City of Courtney recommends the LCRB approve the application for Ace Brewing Company's limited structural change to a liquor license. Two, Council's comments on the prescribed considerations are as follows. A, if the amendment application is approved, it will not result in an increase of noise in the area. B, if the application is approved, it would not negatively impact the community based on the submissions received from the public. C, in order to gather the views of residents, the City of Courtney posted a notice on the City's website outlining the application. Additionally, the RCMP was contacted for comment and indicated having no concerns. And if that could be seconded. Second that. Thank you, Councillor Theos. Uh, and I'll turn it over to staff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll turn this over to uh, Matt Fitzgerald, our director or uh, manager of uh, development planning, who can speak to the report and take questions from council. Thank you, uh, through the CAO, to the mayor and council. So uh, this application is a referral that we received from the LCRB. It's regarding a uh, change to an existing liquor license to add a patio area to the existing brew pub. Uh, as, as just uh, mentioned, the uh, proposal has been advertised on the city's website and as well we did do direct mail outs to the surrounding neighbours uh, advising them of the proposal uh, and inviting any comments they might have. Uh, comments received uh, have been included in the staff report or, or sent to council uh, um, if they were received after the date of the, the council, report, council report. These include comments both uh, in support and, and opposed to the proposal. Uh, staff are recommending that council recommends that the LCRB approve the application, but given some of the comments uh, received, council may uh, wish to consider attaching conditions to approval, uh, such as restricting the hours of operation for the patio or things like uh, playing music on the patio. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. And first, we have Councillor Cole Hamilton. Or, uh, Mr. Allen, did you have a comment as well? or? Councillor Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I, I just want to say I appreciate the work on the report here, and I can certainly see the. Um, uh, I, I guess I have some concerns about. Oh, we've lost you, Councillor Cole Hamilton. Sorry, Councillor uh, Council comments that um, would not result in an increase of noise in the area or. Um, negatively impact the community and uh, just having sort of gone and walked around there over the course of the weekend I feel like that uh, I would be interested in us uh, oh we've lost you again I think you've got me again I'm just I'm just rather than use the space bar I'm just trying to go up and down the uh, the agenda I I noted the in the staff report that um, that uh, Sorry, I'm just finding exactly where it's meaning to be. Um, neighbors' concerns, the impacts are more significant for, for nearby residents on the upper floors or hot south-facing units uh, that um, may merit investigation and potential mitigation measures beyond the use of orientation and vegetation. Um, I think given this is so close to the, the nearby building and there are so many 
overlooking units as compared to say the whistle stop pub which is oriented facing southeast and is uh, some distance further away from trumpeter's landing i, I think if i'd like us to consider uh how we could um uh support those um those type of mitigation measures such as um a solid noise barrier or possibly reducing hours perhaps to closing at 10 o'clock i was wondering if what sort of thoughts staff had about uh what a solid noise barrier wall might look like and how uh how that could be um incorporated uh, go ahead uh, matt yeah thanks for the question um i i think um you know what, what I'd recommend is, is one of the options in the report is that we could go back to the applicant and, and ask for additional information and uh, and they would have um, time to contemplate things like a noise barrier or however that may look. Um, it's, a, it's a bit difficult if you look at the site because the the um, the patio is essentially in the parking area so um, I think it probably would need their their designer to get involved and make sure it fit with the the building and, and that was was aesthetically uh, pleasing uh, so that would be my recommendation. Okay, thanks very much. All right, thanks. And Councillor Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, show my support for the application. I, um, I understand that there probably would be more noise by putting a patio um, on the outside of, in this location, but it is primarily a commercial area. Uh, there is, of course, Trumpeter's Landing there with, the, I believe it's two buildings. Um, but I believe that this is also going to bring a lot of uh, life to the neighborhood and actually be a very positive influence. And so uh, I'm actually going to support it. Thanks very much. Thank you. And Councillor Moore. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I've got uh, kind of mixed um, comments about it. First of all, on a lighter note, I'm happy to see that they're they're accommodating dogs because even though that might sound a bit humorous, um, you know, it is kind of nice when you go for a nice walk around the air park with your dog that you you can go and have a little snack and a refreshment and not have to take your dog home. So I actually think that's kind of a nice idea. Um, and I guess also with um, phase two coming out, um, hopefully with the COVID response, um, patios are going to be recommended um, and I know some other uh, local governments are um, relaxing some bylaws and things to allow for more patios um, so that businesses can uh, absorb some of the um, some of the losses that they may experience. And I guess on that note, um, that might be kind of a, a positive thing in the residents' favor this particular summer because there will be social distancing or sorry, physical distancing requirements on those patios. So they won't really have the full number of seating out there that they would have had. Um, and also not the total number of, of people in the in the facility or in the in the place overall. So I guess I I feel like we need to support um, our local businesses as best we can and allow for these opportunities. It is in a nice area um, for people walking, et cetera. On the other side of that, I do, I, I do really want to um, hear the, the uh, concerns of the residents. And there are a lot of seniors in that area. And of course, many seniors enjoy going for a walk and then going to have a refreshment as well. Um, we can't paint everybody with the same brush, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, the RCMP doesn't have any concerns. What so makes me think that residents have not been calling in the significant um, complaints that they've been having um, around brawls and traffic and screeching tires and all the other things that were mentioned. Um, and, you know, we, as in, in other development proposals, you know, we, I, we have looked at sort of these good neighbor type agreements and I can see these mitigation ideas as being perhaps something that could um, address some of these concerns. So um, I would like to see something that uh, would mitigate some of this, um, having acknowledged that COVID itself is going to 
naturally mitigate some of this because they the business won't be able to have the number of people out on that patio as they they normally would so um i would support it with with some adjustments thanks did you hear that okay yeah i i think uh it, it was certainly wasn't perfect but i think it came through uh Ian okay. and you guys are nodding your heads okay all right uh councillor uh, mccollum you on me oh there we go it was frozen there for a second but you yeah I'm, I'm having a lot of connection issues today too and i i normally have a pretty good internet um connection here so i'm not sure what the issue is sorry about that um yeah i'm also in favor of this application i do certainly acknowledge that there is going to be some noise impacts to the neighborhood but i i do think it's appropriately located it's appropriately zoned um i don't um I, I I think that there are a few limitations that would be reasonably placed on this application. I don't um, see the need for outside seating really after 10 o'clock. Most places have, um, are substantially less busy by that hour. Um, you've, you've frozen up again, uh, Mel, um, or Councillor McCollum. I wonder if maybe uh, turning your video off might have a positive effect. Um, yeah, I'm back, I think. Can you hear me okay? We can uh, possibly turning your video off might have a, a positive effect that just sure. lowers your bandwidth. Yeah. yeah, it's been really patchy. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, and also perhaps limiting um, music after 8 p.m. People tend to talk a lot louder when there's music in the background. So maybe just kind of winding things down somewhat in terms of noise levels um, in the evenings would do um, do something to acknowledge um, what the neighbors' concerns are while still really not impeding um, Ace Brewery's ability to um, run a successful business. And yeah, I would also echo um, Councillor Marn's comments that we need to be looking for ways to support these kind of applications as um, patio service is going to be a lot more important going forward, at least for the short term. So I would be, um, I just think it's really sending the wrong message if the first application that we see uh, here post uh, COVID shutdown would be to say no thanks to um, a patio application. Uh, and then I just had a question, a general question. Uh, there was quite a few I think we've lost you again, Mel. Can you hear me? Oh, you just came back. You yeah. just came back, but we lost you. We lost you there for about thirty seconds or a minute. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm not sure what the issue is. I already checked with the family that no one's using the internet, so I, I, I don't know what the problem is today. There's no Fortnite um, battles going on or anything. Yeah, it's like tell the kids to get off their computers. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask is there was a lot of commentary about um, loud motorcycles and I'm wondering if um, staff can comment whether we've had um, noise complaints or bylaw complaints and if there is, um, if we have an opportunity to kind of address that on kind of, you know, sunny afternoons when when that's known to be a problem. If I might, um, I, this sounds like a bit of a bylaw question uh, by law enforcement. So either John or, or Wendy, Perhaps you could weigh in on this. I can take that, David, uh, through the CAO to Mayor and Council. Um, we don't enforce the Motor Vehicle Act, so anything on noisy motorcycles, et cetera, would be done by the RCMP. Um, so they typically, well, they do respond. They have their decibel meters, et cetera. So that's not something we would hear about, but for sure that's Motor Vehicle Act infractions. Okay, great. Thank you. I think I'll leave it at that. All right. Thanks, Councillor uh, McCollum and Councillor uh, Hillian. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as others have noted, I find myself uh, torn between uh, wanting to support uh, the business opportunity, but having uh, concerns for the legitimate uh, issues brought up by the residents. And I think one resident made the point that uh, while they did move into a, a building across the street from one pub, 
they didn't move in across the street from two pubs and that's what we now have. Um, and um, I think that the mitigation measures that have been suggested by the applicant fall short. I'd like to suggest that um, we have staff go back to have further dialogue with the applicant based on the concerns that have been expressed to determine what further mitigation could take place. I think there have been a number of good suggestions uh, from the potential of earlier closing to um, a sound attenuation uh, fence as opposed to simply shrubbery. Um, I'm not sure whether um, Councillor Morin's comment that uh, the owners were planning to put a dog compound in, I thought that was a suggestion coming from a resident, uh, but I, we could be both wrong on that, I'm not sure. Um, but I did think that was an interesting uh, um, issue that might uh, encourage uh, business. Um, anyway, that's, I'm not prepared to vote in favor of this today, but I would be prepared to uh, postpone it to have staff have further dialogue with the applicant to see what mitigation can take place. Thank you. All right, thanks, Councillor Hillian. And Councillor Morin. Yeah, just hopefully a quick question. Um, if we were to, uh, to ask for some more stringent, um, you know, uh, measures in terms of closing earlier, or whatever it was, um, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't prevent them from coming back down the road if if they have a good year of no complaints or if they want to extend it down the road, they can come back again. Correct. Extend the hours outside or or whatever. I, I think that's a question for either Matt or Ian. Yeah, um, through through say to Mayor and Council. Yeah, if they, if they wanted to amend it later on, they would have that option, and it would be the, the same process that we're moving right now. I guess I'm just thinking it would it would be good to have a more kind of cautious, uh, uh, you know, um, approach to start with and see how things go. And I agree with uh, Councillor uh, Hillian's idea. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much, and Councillor Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, I'm also very torn. I mean, I see, I see the the definite benefit to this of this patio to the viability of this business, and I don't think a patio per se is the wrong uh, the wrong way of moving forward. But I think there are small changes, like as I suggested, perhaps and Councillor McCollum did also closing the patio at ten o'clock, perhaps not having music outside and uh, looking into some something more solid than simply shrubbery to just uh, attenuate the sound towards Trumpeter's Landing. I don't think it's a matter of saying no to this. I think it's a matter of just fine tuning it slightly so it balances interests uh, more effectively. So I would support a um, just a further examination of some slightly uh, um, adjusted uh, measures to attenuate sound. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. And Councillor Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I, I would um, tend to agree with some of those statements. I think maybe just um, changing the hours to be a, maybe an hour earlier and, and looking at um, something a little more creative, a little bit bigger on the sound attenuation and, the, and dividing up that parking lot into a more clear area might be helpful. So if um, staff are up for having that conversation. Um, other, otherwise, I I think this really is the appropriate place for this. And I think it will be a great uh, addition to the community. Um, I, I think we should be careful not to confuse people driving around fast on motorcycles and cars as being directly linked to the average person who goes and sits at a patio. Okay. And Mr. Allen. Just for something that council is leaning towards option two, and if that's the case, uh, perhaps we could uh, get a resolution in support of that. Uh, I barely heard you that time. You may, I'm not sure if you need to speak up or. I, I, it sounds like council is leaning towards option two in the staff report on page 56 of the agenda. And if that is the case, then uh, perhaps council could uh, move ahead with that, uh, that option. Okay. Um, uh, Councillor Hillian, uh, uh, sorry, I was looking to see who moved this. Was it Councillor uh, Morin, I think? Councillor Morin, did you want to alter your motion? Could we just could we just vote on it, Mayor? And 
Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, I was just yeah. going to say she could she could alter it, and then we could vote on that, and then we'd be probably done. I think. The other option would be to withdraw the original motion, and then uh, yeah. we could simply move to option two. Yeah. How about I do that? I'll withdraw that motion. Thanks. I'll right. second that motion. Excellent. Uh, well, I think if it's withdrawn, it's withdrawn. Yeah. So do you want to move option two, Councillor Moran? Sorry. Uh, point of order, Mayor. Um, I don't. I don't think you can just withdraw it. I, I think you have to vote on that. Sure. Uh, all right. Well, we'll vote on withdrawal then. Uh, starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. Uh, support. Uh, Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. Uh, point of order, Mr. Mayor. It's perfectly in order to withdraw. In favor. Yeah, that's what I you, thought. You simply need the agreement of the mover and the yeah, seconder. and then the seconder. That's me. I know. I know. I'm just trying to. Everyone's trying to save time here because we're running out. Uh, so, uh, you know, could we just get? Could we just get clarity move, from? Move option two, please, Councillor okay. Morgan, and we'll just we'll go from there. Just for future, Mayor, why don't we get clarity from staff? Is that? Are you happy with that? So, uh, John, I can Ward, comment. Yep. Please comment. Thank you, through the CEO to Mayor and Council. Technically, once a motion is moved and seconded, it's it's owned by the floor. So you have to get agreement of the floor to remove it. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue. Uh, I think we were on Councillor Frisch. So we'll in favor. Uh, Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. Favor. I'm also in favor of uh, withdrawing this motion. All right, now that it's withdrawn, Councilor Morin. Okay, this one's easy. Uh, I move that Council defer approval of the application with a request for additional information or alternative conditions of approval. Second. Excellent, and for staff, is that clear enough uh, with the comments that we gave today? Yes. All right. Okay, I will pull council once again in favor of option two. Uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. Oh, Councillor McCollum. Oh, uh, maybe she can't hear us. Uh, I'm going to go Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. Councillor Morin, can you hear us? McCollum. Uh, what's that? In favor. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> oh, the, the, cy the cyber gods are out to get us today. Um, and I'm in I favor everyone, as well. Everyone's so, tuckered out from the weekend, so now they're all just sitting in front of their computer today. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay, uh, so I believe that that's a unanimous decision uh, by council. Um, and uh, next we have a building amendment bylaw 3004 for Council Hillian. Mr. Mayor, I'm pleased to move that based on the May 11th uh, staff report, building amendment bylaw number 3004 2020 solid fuel burning appliances, that Council support option one and proceed to first, second, and third readings and final adoption of building amendment bylaw number 3004 2020 solid fuel burning appliances. Second. Excellent. Uh, and I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, we're pleased to be able to bring this forward to, to council and I'll turn it over to Ian Buck to uh, summarize the report and take questions from council. Yeah, thanks very much through the CEO to mayor and council. Um, very quickly, the, uh, the bylaw is uh, I think self-explanatory. It follows what other local governments have done and uh, generally follows um, regulations that were put out by the province a number of years ago. Um, but in a nutshell, any new construction would be prohibited from installing um, a solid fuel burning appliance. Um, that includes a number of different um, things such as pellet stoves, wood stoves, um, and, and the like. Um, exempt would continue to be um, gas burning appliances. Um, if a person has existing um, older uh, wood burning stoves or or the like, uh, they would be allowed to replace that, um, but they would have to meet EPA guidelines um, or the equivalent um, CSA standards. They're they're basically the same. Uh, EPA is often referenced only because a lot of manufacturers um, have that stamp on their appliances. And um, I'll leave it at that and take any questions. 
Okay. Um, and we have Councillor Hillian. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to be clear that um, um, in moving to final adoption today, uh, was there a, a reason that uh, we opted to go this route as opposed to perhaps giving some um, additional time for uh, uh, public feedback? Um, not that I am advocating that. Uh, I think we, we are pretty clear on, on the intent and, and such, but I'm just a little concerned about uh, the short process. And I wonder if, if we can identify a rationale for that. Mr. Allen? Uh, well, basically because we can. Um, and, and we have the, you know, it's an option of course, and I understand the, the sentiments behind those, uh, that question or, or comment. Um, so certainly this isn't without some level of controversy amongst, uh, you know, and concern amongst those that uh, provide these solid uh, fuel burning uh, devices. Um, and uh, so certainly that's an option. And I think uh, the option is, I can't quite see it here. Oh, yeah, the council defer, um, or that uh, actually I don't see it actually here. Um, so that would be the option would be then just to have three readings and then to perhaps uh, wait for comments. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Ian just to uh, to uh, lay out the options uh, in, in more detail. Yeah, thanks very much uh, again through the CEO to Mayor and Council. Um, the rationale was just following the new um, provincial guidelines that allow for this. Um, uh, we typically on a relatively minor amendment like this wouldn't refer it out to the public after third reading. Um, but if there's discomfort, um, we can certainly take that direction from council. Um, I'll just add that um, the real impact is, um, is on new construction um, where it's prohibited. We get very few, um, at, at best a handful a year um, that are installing wood burning appliances. Um, so there shouldn't be too much concern there any new items that are purchased um, are going to have to meet these higher standards. So replacing stoves, unless you're getting one, um, you know, off of uh, social media or something uh, should be meeting the guidelines anyway. So the impact should be relatively minor. Thanks. I, I certainly support the resolution. I believe it puts us in line with uh, the other communities in the Comox Valley and it uh, enables us to take at least one step while we're awaiting uh, further uh, recommendations from the airshed advisory uh, group that has been formed at the regional district which will hopefully give us some tools to um, address poor burning practices by existing stoves stove owners uh, that are co uh, creating air quality concerns thanks very much to staff for bringing this forward all right thanks very much uh councillor frisch yeah, thanks, Mayor, and thanks to staff for bringing this forward. Certainly in favor with this in general. I just have, I have two questions. Um, one is in the bylaw, it's 19.2, um, and it states that uh, despite 19.1, uh, a solid fuel burning appliance may be installed in a building that existed prior to May 31st, 2020. And I wonder if that should be um, more like a solid fuel burning appliance can be installed in a building where one, you know, where a, a fuel, a solid fuel burning plants uh, currently existed, which I'm wondering which one it is. Is it the building that existed or the building that already had a, a fireplace? Uh, again, over to Ian. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following you, but it, the intent here is if, um, if it was in replacement for an existing Right. solid fuel burning appliance um then you would be allowed to do that sure okay so that does make sense my apologies and uh the other scenario is that if um like in section 19.1 it talks about um a building relying on in part or whole uh on a on a on a fuel a solid fuel burning appliance does does that mean that you could put one in as a secondary heat source Uh, thanks again for the question. No, the intent here is that whether in whole or part means if, if you're using it at all uh, mm -hmm. as a heat source, uh, whether it's for heating of the home or for water, it would be prohibited. Mm -hmm. So I do have a problem with that. Um, I think it's wise to have um, fireplaces in buildings as a backup and secondary heat source. Um, 
I realize that to some people that's problematic because um, essentially we can't control when people use it. So essentially they could have a backup system and use it as their primary heat source. Uh, nonetheless, um, I'd rather support something that included um, uh, wood burning appliances as, as a secondary heat source. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I think that really defeats the purpose of the bylaw. So, um, but maybe I'll turn it back to Ian. Uh, thanks again. I, you, you're right. The intent is to um, to outright prohibit them regulating, um, as you say, on a on a backup source versus primary source when you're using one or the other would become tricky. Um, but we're certainly willing to amend it on council's direction. Yeah, I think um, I, I know hydro has a uh, sometimes a thing where you can get like a hydro reduced rate or something for your baseboard heat or other kinds of heat uh, if you have a fireplace. But um, yeah, it would probably be a bit of a challenge because uh, anybody could say that it is a, a secondary uh, source of heat, um, which again, if we have long power outages and stuff, there's certainly um, a potential there. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, if the intent is to get people off of wood, wood heat um, uh, as much as possible, that, that's kind of, I guess, the, uh, the reason behind it, this one um, uh, motion, which I think is, is the same in Comox and Cumberland at this point. Yeah, Mayor, if, if I may speak to that, I, yeah. I think that the intention is definitely to get rid of, um, you know, bad burning practices, inefficient uh, systems. I think this actually, uh, it won't, actually, I don't think it will do that. As you mentioned, there are very few houses that um, that actually get fireplaces put in and probably the new buildings with fireplaces are really, uh, really efficient fireplaces and aren't the ones that are contributing largely to the issue, although it all contributes, of course. So I wonder if, um, I mean, for optics, this probably looks great, but uh, I don't, I don't know that it's the right step. I, I would support this if we allowed um, wood burning appliances as a secondary heat source. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Councilor Moore. Sorry, just unmuting. So, is there an ability? I, I see. Uh, owners can replace um, with the, you know, a stove with better, newer standards. But I guess I'm wondering, say, old house, why we would need to allow that? Um, if someone, you know, I'm just wondering if oh boy okay sorry about that yeah it's such a great background ah oh, darn it um i was just curious about in the sale of a house why we would um permit new owners to replace like i know there are bylaws that that say um when the when you know when there's a new owner that uh that there's no replacement can you provide some clarification on that? Were you able to hear that, Ian? Yeah, yeah well, um, just before Ian weighs in, I think this is this is not the time to have this discussion. If you're really wanting to get this bylaw, you know, in place and follow what's going on or across the the, the Comox Valley, um, what you're talking about here is is um, other types of uh, you know uh, more um, effective uh, bylaws and, and uh, processes that presumably would come out of the airshed advisory uh, process. So, I mean, I guess I, you know, we've uh, pushed to get this in front of council because council indicated this was one of its top priorities, but now we're kind of getting into the, the details. Uh, and if you, you know, doing it at this meeting is not the place to do it, especially when we're asking council, I guess, uh, to consider three readings and adoption. If you wanna send it back to staff with uh, various discussions on uh, nuances related to the bylaw, then by all means, uh, let's do that. But um, I, I, we, can't, we can't make these changes on the fly. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought it did relate to this because it does talk about the replacement in the bylaw. So I just wondered, um, 
you know, well, whether it, whether the owner, it, it's like the owner's allowed to replace it. And I guess that would be a completely separate bylaw if in the I case of the so, sale. I'll turn, I'll turn okay. Back to All right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks through the CO to Mayor and Council. So that section's independent of who owns the uh, the building, whether it's a current owner or a new owner. It's following what's out there from other municipalities. Um, I would tend to agree with other comments that have been made uh, that if there is broader regulation or more stringent beyond this, uh, take it out of the uh, advisory committee uh, when that time comes. And um, but if there is a desire to get something in place for this burning season, I think now's the time to do it. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, Councillor McCollum. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely in favor of this. I think it's a good um, first step to addressing some of our air quality issues. Um, I don't know that it's going to make a huge difference, but um, we need to start taking action that's moving us in the direction of cutting down on some of the wood smoke. And this I see as a pretty easy um, first step in that regard. We're just lining up with um, what our neighboring municipalities have already done. Um, I don't see the need to go back and consider uh, whether or not we want a secondary heat source. I, I'm fairly um, certain that most wood stoves are secondary heat sources as they are right now. Um, because if you don't have a backup, if you claim that a wood stove is your primary heat source, I, it's my understanding that it triples your house insurance. So just about every house has more than one type of heating source. So I mean, putting that into the bylaw would basically render it ineffective. So I, it, that's not something that I think that we should open up. And um, I think the next step should be to um, spend some time looking at how we deal with uh, problem houses and neighborhoods that continue to uh, burn it irresponsibly. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks very much. I don't see any further hands right now. And, and yeah, you know, this was something that came up uh, years ago when we first um, started getting the, the reports back on the air quality. Um, well, first we're getting air quality advisories when, once the, uh, um, the actual air quality uh, system went in to actually analyze the air. Um, we've had multiple uh, presentations uh, from our medical health officer and, and various uh, health officials across Vancouver Island. Um, this seemed like a very simple thing, uh, but it did get deferred to, um, you know, the air uh, shed uh, air quality uh, advisory group. Uh, but unfortunately, that that group has has yet to meet yet, as far as I know. Um, and so this just seemed like a really low hanging fruit thing to um, pass through um, and really just get that 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 alignment throughout the uh, the community and and to send a message that this is uh, something that we do find important. So. Um, and Councillor Frisch, something new. Well, no, no, I was actually just looking to lower my hand and I hit something else. So oh. <laughs> I'll figure it out and lower it, thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, All right, uh, having said that, um, it's been moved and seconded. I'm now gonna call uh, poll council, uh, starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well, so that's unanimous. Uh, thanks everybody for that. Uh, I think probably longer than anticipated conversation. We are uh, past 2.30 with another in camera coming up after this. So uh, just keeping that in mind. Um, and we will go into the internal reports and correspondence for information. And we're gonna receive uh, the first, uh, the three briefing notes all at once. And I'll pass it over to Councillor Morin. Uh, Mayor, shall I move receipt of briefing note? Uh, uh, the 2020 Canada Day celebrations cancelled due to COVID-19. Briefing note two, 2020 Heritage BC Award for Lawrence Burns. And briefing note three, Fifth Street Bridge Rehabilitation Update. I'll second the receipt of those. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, are there any uh, comments that staff want to make uh, or any questions that the council has regarding uh, any three of these uh, briefing notes? And I have uh, Councillor Hillian. Thanks, Mayor. And um, I just uh, can't let the uh, meeting go by without uh, acknowledging the the award uh, that has been uh, the Heritage Award that has been uh, 
given to uh, Lawrence Burns. And uh, um, I think uh, there it is, the mayor's holding it up. I'm sure all of council would enjoy, uh, join with me in congratulating Lawrence and thanking him for his service to the city. And um, I certainly trust that we'll be able to find a, a public occasion at some point in the near future when we can uh, appropriately acknowledge Lawrence. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Hillian. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Councillor Theos. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, no, uh, that I also agree uh, that um, that um, uh, was very nice to acknowledge Councillor or to, to acknowledge Lawrence Burns uh, uh, for that award. Um, also, uh, you know, quite difficult news about Canada Day. Uh, you know, from day one when the pandemic uh, occurred, that was something we had discussed at, at the table. And um, it, it even seemed at that point that it was going to be very difficult to move forward with Canada Day. So that's, um, uh, that's a challenging circumstance that the community always gets behind and looks forward to. So hopefully next year will be bigger and better than ever, uh, done in a physical distancing way to the best of what can be done. Thirdly, I just wanted to ask uh, in regards to the um, Fifth Street Bridge project, uh, you know, as we saw with, um, with our Greenwood trunk, uh, the, uh, the costs had come down from what were our expectations were as in terms of the, the moving forward on the project. And I am hearing um, other scenarios where costs are coming down on, on other projects of sig significance. And I am I'm wanting to put it forward to um, the staff to uh, uh, you know, be uh, very cognizant of the fact that, um, that uh, this cost seemed to escalate quite a bit over the last couple of years. And uh, when that procurement comes, in, comes forward and the tendering, I, I really strongly feel that we should be holding these, uh, these potential uh, bidders uh, feet to the fire to ensure that we get the, the best price possible. Uh, If I could, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things there uh, worth mentioning, and I, I, I'd be happy to turn, uh, turn it over to Chris Davidson for some of the technical questions. But I can tell you that in my discussions with some of my peers and colleagues, uh, particularly in the asset management, uh, asset management BC, there has been um, a leveling out and lowering, in fact, of uh, at least the escalation, in some cases, a significant reduction in, in some of these costs. The other thing to keep in mind is that as we um, look at the re BC restart, one of the um, one of the things that's quite important, I'm sure, to the province and, and uh, municipal and local governments is how do we uh, reboot the economy? And one of the best ways to do that is by uh, is through infrastructure renewal and and um, capital projects. And that's something we're well positioned to move forward with, especially in this uh, in this situation here. Um, and we have a grant that's already been extended once, and uh, there's no guarantee that it'll get, be extended again. Um, in fact, I would say, and it's very anecdotal, but uh, based on the turnaround time for uh, the um, alternate approval process uh, bylaw uh, from the, the province, uh, about a week, uh, unprecedented in our experience, there seems to be a lot of interest, uh, I'm sure, um, and there's economic multipliers and there's lots of evidence that uh, infrastructure renewal and spending um, really uh, sustains the economy um, and brings jo long lasting jobs. So um, I know we're running out of time, so I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, yeah, and I think that was a good, a good discussion if there's nothing uh, further. Um, uh, Chris, did you wanna add anything or is that that good? Uh, thank you. Uh, no, that's good for me. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Uh, seeing that, I'll uh, pull council. Actually, you know what? Unless you uh, want to vote against it, raise your hand if you want to vote against the uh, briefing notes. Uh, otherwise, I'll um, uh, it's been received uh, with unanimous uh, consent. Uh, and moving on to Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. And Mayor, I'll move the receipt of the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Commission meeting minutes. We'll second that. Excellent. And uh, I'll pass it over to staff if you want to make any comments. Uh, I don't know if it, we, we have anything to say, but uh, again, uh, Dave Snyder uh, is here um, and can weigh in uh, as needed. Just looking for a receipt. 
Perfect. Excellent. I don't see any hands going up. So uh, um, unless uh, somebody puts their hand up, oh, Councillor Theos. Thanks, Mayor. I wanted to ask uh, on on the in the minutes uh, we had a discussion about the um, uh, recreation ban among among a few other issues, uh, uh, but um, in, in regards to the recreation ban, uh, now you know since um, you know we that meeting things have um, have obviously changed uh, you know across uh, the world, but um, as in terms of that physical distancing component, how is it now with uh, with uh, buses and, and vehicles such as that, as in terms of uh, what their uh, requirements are or may be moving forward, um, you know, is there going to be any issues that could affect us in that regard um, in, in that component? And then one of the other issues, um, you know, where there was mention about, um, about uh, uh, Philberg uh, having renovations at some point, it's just the discussion, uh, when we look at our renovations um, uh, moving forward, has there been discussion among staff about uh, if I, I know it would be somewhat hy hypothetical at the moment, but as things move forward, are we possibly talking about having physical di distancing measures as part of our component of, of construction of our projects or renovations of our projects? Thank you. I'll weigh in on that if I could, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's a subject for a whole separate discussion. Um, and in fact, some of this is gonna be, uh, is on the in camera for uh, the next uh, 20 minutes or 19 minutes that we have here, um, unless council can, and I'll turn this back to John. Maybe there's a way to extend um, the meeting uh, time uh, or Wendy um, as needed. Well, yeah, I, th I think that was uh, the general, thought was to have a two hour uh, meeting, but of course council, it's council's meeting. So if it goes over, it goes over. So just to wrap up on uh, Councillor Theos's uh, question. Yeah, this is a big, uh, big uh, d discussion. Um, we're only now, uh, I mean, the, uh, the announcement of the restart BC was last week by the premier. Uh, so we're only just now getting all of the uh, guidelines coming to us. Uh, for the different sectors, that includes uh, uh, that includes obviously the city's facilities. Um, I, I could easily turn it over to Dave Snyder for more detail, but I don't know if this is the time or place for that discussion. I think that's going to be coming back to council in the next uh, uh, week or two uh, when we have more information. Okay, and um, all right. So uh, I think for for that right now. Um, we'll um, go on receipt. Uh, so uh, unless somebody uh, is against receipt, I'm gonna assume that we're gonna uh, approve unanimous receipt of this. And that's for the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission meeting minutes. Uh, uh, next is the in-camera resolution. And that's for Councillor Theos. I've got it right here if you want. Um, I think I think uh, Councillor Theo says Mike is muted. I think that's the challenge. No, I'm just uh, I'm just getting to it on the on the agenda. Sorry, my video had frozen for a second there. Give me half moment. All right. Okay. I move that notice uh, is here by given that a special in camera meeting close to the public will be held May 11th, 2020 at the conclusion of the regular council meeting pursuant to the following subsections of the community charter, 90-1-C uh, labor relations of or other employee relations, 90-1-K negotiations and related discussions respecting the uh, proposed provision of a municipal service that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of the council could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality uh, if uh, they were held in public. I'll second that. Excellent, and I'll pull council for this. Uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. Favor. 
And I'm in favor as well. That's unanimous. Uh, moving right along, we do have some bylaws. I'll move uh, some. <laughs> I think it's me, isn't it? Our nice place. Um, I'll move that um, building bylaw amend amendment number 3004 uh, 2020, a bylaw to amend City of Courtney building bylaw number 3001 2020 to regulate solid fuel burning appliances past first, second, and third readings. Seconded. Excellent. Uh, and we've had a lengthy discussion on this. I don't see any hands up. Uh, I'm going to pull council. Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Uh, Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCullum. I saw you mouth in favor, uh, so we'll take that as is. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. I'm in favor. I'm in favor as well. Uh, and then uh, we'll pass it over to, I think Councillor Frisch has the last one here. Sure, I'll move that um, uh, building bylaw amendment number 3004-2020, uh, pass final adoption. Okay, and I see Councillor, uh, uh, Helene, were you going to second that or did you have a question? Separate question, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton, were you going to second that? I was going to second that, yes. Okay, excellent. And then uh, Councillor Helene, you had a question? Sorry, unrelated to this, Mr. Mayor. My apologies. Okay. Uh, if it's unrelated uh, and I see no further questions or comments, we'll poll Council. Uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Uh, Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Helene. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well, so that's unanimous again. Uh, excellent. Um, and uh, one last thing on our public, our Councillor Hilling, you had one more uh, comment that was unrelated. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to apologize to council and staff for my earlier uh, objection, I, which uh, turned out to be an error. It was clearly in, inappropriate and I apologize. Okay, thanks. And 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 I know, uh, um, and it may be that it's something at the regional district because I know uh, I've been at meetings where a, a simple withdrawal from the mover has been sufficient. So I think yeah, it's all good. Um, all right. Uh, with that, uh, one last thing, which is adjournment. We have adjournment. Second. Uh, is anybody not in agreement of, of adjournment? All right. We'll uh, consider it. Uh, unanimous for adjournment and we will go in camera as soon as this ends.